All right, smart snap is the marketing term for snapshots in an Imble storage array. And so let's talk about snapshotting here. What's a snapshot? Um, well, if we've got data, right, that's part of our volume and we want to snapshot that, basically we're just gonna lock those blocks associated with that data in place and um, then any new data will continue to be written and it won't modify even if these blocks were modified during that process just means the modified data will be written in as new data but we won't obviously change the old data so historically on other platforms they've utilized what are called copy on write snapshots or cows <laughs> um, and they they do something a little bit differently right this when you do when you change data that has been snapped, they actually take that locked data, they move it down into a snapshot reserve, and they go and they change the they change the block and put it where the previous block resided within the storage pool. And um, you can see that then every time we take a snapshot and then we data changes over time, we're actually moving data around on the back end. So there's going to be some write amplification that happens associated with data protection. So on Nimble, we utilize what are called redirect on write snapshots or, or rows. And it's going to work a little bit different, right? We snapshot the data. And then as a block changes, it's simply written down into the new data change blocks. Um, and so there's no, there's, there's no write amplification at all. There's no IO or moving blocks around as data changes over time. So here's, here's the concept, right? I got my file. A, B, C, D blocks, I take a snapshot at 10 o'clock, right? And then I um, make a change um, to B, right? And so now I've got B prime and at 11 o'clock I take a snapshot and now it's got A, B prime, C and D, right? And B continues to reside inside the snapshot, um, snapshot 10 at 10 o'clock. Oh, let me pop this back, sorry. So, I mean, that's really all we're talking about is just each snapshot is going to hold whatever the delta is or whatever the change is since the last snapshot based upon whatever is being changed in the live data. And the you'll notice here it's it's all about metadata pointers in this particular case because we're not moving data around or rewriting it. Um, the 10 o'clock snapshot right is pointing to all of these blocks. The 11 o'clock snapshot is right because we've got A, B, C, D and then there's B prime. Right, and 11 is pointed to all these minus B, just B prime. 10 is pointed to those ones. So we've still written just these amount of blocks, but the snapshots are pointing to different blocks based upon the point in time in which they were created. Does that make sense to everybody? Clear as mud? Maybe. All right. I'm going to assume there's no questions, so you're getting it. Um, so things to keep in mind as you're designing how you're going to utilize snapshots in your environment. You need to understand your RPO, your recovery point objective, which is how much data are you willing to lose? How often are you going to take a snapshot, right? And be able to, and that's going to dictate, you know, anything that's changed from this point in time until when the disaster strikes, that data would theoretically be lost because the soonest point in time you can go back to is this recovery point objective, right? So there's also RTOs when you come into this piece. And that is how long does it take me to actually get back up and running? Um, you know, what's my downtime in between? And so you need to figure out what your SLA is. And that's gonna be different a lot of times based upon what your applications are. Um, different applications will have different RPOs and RTOs. And um, you should be able to design whatever your data protection strategy is around meeting those SLAs. Um, some people are just pretty haphazard about it. And they simply say, oh, I'm just gonna protect everything every hour and hope it works out. I'm gonna keep 30 days of everything. You really can be much more strategic than that. But I mean, if that blanket approach works, then it works. Everybody's environment's a little bit different. And obviously each organization is gonna have different requirements. Um, and that could be driven by compliance. It could be driven by um, how your management views your data. Um, or sometimes it's just driven by IT and how paranoid your engineers are. 
Um, I know certainly when I worked for Northwest Pipe, that was the way that it worked a lot of times was um, I was the most paranoid one in the group. And so I was the one driving the RPO and RTO SLAs. Um, when you are doing a, you know, a synchronous replication sort of a solution, meaning um, everything that's written to one place is also written to another place and they are in sync with each other, um, which is what we utilize in our pure persistence solution, you can drive your R RTO down very, very low. So your RPO is going to be zero, right? Because you've got a copy of your data that's real time in both places and your failover from one to the other will dictate your RTO. Sometimes that can be instantaneous, so your RTO is zero. Sometimes it might take a, you know, five minutes or an hour to get up and running on the other, but you lost no data because you're always synchronously replicating data to the other repository. So um, that's synchronous replication, which can be utilized on a nimble storage array. Um, that's not the way snapshots work, though. Snapshots enable asynchronous replication. So for every snapshot, right, and the time between each snapshot is going to dictate your RPO, or how much data will be lost. And then depending on what mechanism you use to bring your snapshots online during a, a um, disaster, you might have something automated like um, Site Recovery Manager for VMware. Um, something like that might have everything up and running in a matter of minutes or maybe just an hour or so. If you have a manual process, it could take you a few days to get all of your stuff up and running out of your snapshots. So even though your RPO is very low, say you took a snapshot every 15 minutes, um, your RTO could be anywhere from five minutes to five days, depending on what mechanism you use to bring online. Any questions about RPOs and RTOs? Does that all make sense? Hopefully that's not a new concept to everybody, but I do like to make sure I cover it because a lot of times we have people that are new to storage and data protection in these classes. Um, so things to consider, right? Change rates. Um, the, your change rate is one of the things, well, change rate and retention are the two things that dictate the amount of capacity that's going to be utilized by your snapshots on a nimble storage array. And so the change rates, the amount of data, obviously that's been changed or modified in any given point in time. And in this case, we're talking about the change rate between snapshots. What data has been changed since my snapshot at 10 o'clock versus my one at 11 o'clock. So the higher the change rate, the more bandwidth right? The more capacity that will be taken up for the snapshots and the more bandwidth that will be needed to replicate those snapshots um, off-site, either to the cloud or to another nimble storage array. And so both that change rate will then have an effect on both your RPO and your RTO, right? So um, snapshots are obviously are being managed by your volume collections. We've already talked about that today, about how volume collections are configured and how we can use them to do um, crash consistent versus application consistent snapshots and then what your different scheduling capabilities are. Um, you can also do manual snapshots though and I used to do this in my environments anytime that I had a major change coming up to a system I would go into the volumes and take a manual snapshot as a, a uh, that's my parachute right my go back in time place if I needed to in case something crazy were to happen. Even if I had regular snapshots happening, I, I, was, I created a, a manual one and I would usually name it pre-ERP upgrade, right? Or pre-database upgrade or something like that. And then when I was done, I would go in and delete it. Something to keep in mind, when you do manual snapshots, they're not being managed by a volume collection. Therefore, there's no set retention on them and they will never go away unless you go in and manually delete them. And so it is possible after creating a bunch of manual snapshots to have those orphaned. And if you forget about them over time, the size of the snapshot can actually grow because the snapshot contains all of the blocks that have changed since the previous snapshot. If you take a point in time and let's say you, you wait uh, three months and, and you forget, you've forgotten about it, what are the chances that there's been a lot of change in that particular data set since you took the snapshot 90 days ago? Pretty high, right? And so all of the change from today until when you manually took the snapshot is going to be held within that snapshot. So they can actually grow over time if they aren't managed. So, um, but you can take manual snapshots, do leverage them. It's a great way to protect your data, but just make sure that you delete them when you're done. Um, when you do a manual one, you're just going to name it 
and put in a description and then you want to say what you're going to do. By default, a snapshot is just going to be offline and won't be writable, but you can bring them online. You can make them writable. Really, the, the times that you would utilize online and writable is like if you're using a backup integration where they want to read or write into a, a particular snapshot while they're backing up whatever's in the snapshot. Those are the most common use cases anyway. When you create a snapshot, right, the name oftentimes will dictate what it's doing. And you can, you can go in under data protection for a volume. You can look and see what the snapshots are. We see this one as HPE vol collection, HPE daily. So this was probably created by a volume collection, most likely by the name. And so it's going to age out after a certain number of days based on the retention configured there. This EDU snapshot was probably manually created because it's not have the same naming convention as the volume collection one does. Neither one of these is being replicated. Um, but in this particular case, this is one you'd want to keep an eye on and maybe you might need to manually delete later. Let's see here. Um, if you want to check what the status of a particular snapshot is, if it's still being created, if it's being replicated, when it was created, all that stuff is done here on the, the data protection tab. Um, what's considered new data, anything changed between snapshots, whether the snapshot owns it or not, right? So data written to the primary volume, um, existing data that's overwritten uh, or changed, uh, data no longer used by a primary volume but retained by the snapshot, that's all considered new data. And that's gonna add to the size of that particular snapshot. Um, I'll give you a, an example here. Um, had a customer took a manual snapshot of a data store in a VMware environment. That data store had about 20 VMs running in it. And um, a couple weeks, and it was just before he did kind of some kind of system upgrade, right? He was just being, you know, just wanted to go back to place. And um, a couple weeks later, he hadn't gone back and cleaned that up yet, which wasn't that big of a deal. It wasn't huge. And there wasn't a lot of change rate in those particular VMs. But he did some, some reorganization of his storage and he did a storage vMotion and he had actually moved all 20 VMs out of that data store a couple weeks later into a new data store and moved some new ones into that one. Well, at that point in time, what's considered new data in that snapshot? All of the data from the, pre, the, data, the VMs that had previously been in the data store were now considered new data because that was all changed. Right, that's, you know, all that stuff that was in there before isn't in there now. And so all of a sudden that snapshot went from being, you know, you know, a, a couple gig to, uh, you know, it was all, you know, it was, it was several terabytes of space actually that it took up and the, the I, you know, they, they looked at it and they're like, whoa, there was all of a sudden this huge hop in, in capacity utilization. And it, it happened because, you know, they basically changed all of the data in a particular data store and they had a manual snapshot that was holding onto the data from several weeks before. So just kind of an example there of kind of how that works. Um, something else, though, to, to kind of keep in mind here, and this, this talks about it here, about utilization. In fact, let me do this. Um, where is my whiteboard? Here. When we're talking about snapshots, I've had some customers say, well, snapshots just take up too much space, and so I don't want to use them. And um, I would just say, yes, they do. And you do have to plan for them, but keep, it, keep, in, keep a couple things in mind when you're talking about snapshots. First of all, especially crash consistent snapshots, they're instantaneous. So there's, there's really no IO impact. If you're doing application consistent, you're going to quies, right, the, the host or the VM that they're connected to. That they might be a little bit slower. It might take two seconds rather than a half a second in order to run. It just depends how much transaction, right? How much needs to be quiesced. Um, and, but you're still not, there's no IO associated with that, just whatever resources are running on the host at the time. So you do have to manage that piece on how often you're taking those. But for generally speaking, when you're talking about snapshots, they're really lightweight because they're redirect on write. And so this is the way this works. If I've got volume one here, right? And I take a snapshot and let's say that I take a snapshot um, four times in a day. So every six hours um, is, is the way we're doing this. And um, 
So I've got a six hour RPO at this time, at this point, which is okay, right? If something bad were to happen, going back six hours is not too bad. And that's four in that given day. Let's say that my Delta each day for this given data set um, is 10 gigs. So my, my data set changes on average about 10 gigs within this volume. So it's kind of average, right? How much space will, and let's say that my retention is just one day, okay? How much space are these snapshots gonna take up within the pool on my nimble storage array? If my change rate is 10 gigs a day and my retention is one day, what's my snapshot utilization gonna be? Anybody? Did I lose y'all? Everybody went to lunch, huh? Nah, my head hurts. I can't figure it out. <laughs> so it's going to be 10 gigs, right? If my retention is one day and my change rate is 10 gigs a day, then the overall utilization of these snapshots is going to be 10 gigs. So on average, how big is each snapshot going to be? 2.5 gigs, right? For each one of those. So that's that's not too bad. If let's say that, though we decided that um, for disaster recovery, we want to make sure that we've got two days worth. So we're going to go up to eight snapshots and we want two days. And now it's 10, 10 a day and it's 2.5 per. So now my total capacity utilization for all of these is what? 20 gigs, right? Because it's two days worth. And we're just we're going averages. I realize things will spike and stuff, but we got about 20 gigs of utilization out of this volume just in snapshots. But is now, it going to be smaller um, because like the dedupe and the point, you know, pointing to a single block and all this other stuff? Or is that well, not taken into account with snapshots? It is taken into account. My assumption for this example is that this 10 gigs a day includes data reduction. Oh, okay. So that's just that's just how much it, it takes up here. But yes, you, that's exactly right. Dedupe, compression, um, all of that kind of stuff does come into play on snapshots, and um, it does reduce the total amount of space that the data takes up. But I'm just kind of saying, as, as we capacity plan, you know, how much space are my snapshots going to take up? You know, we're still got the same change rate. We've now got two days worth at two and a half a day or two and a half every six hours or every snapshot. So we got about 20 gigs of snapshots. Now, what if though this RPO isn't good enough? This six hour RPO, what if really we want a three hour RPO? So what does that really mean? It's, it's rather than every six hours, every three hours. So now I've just doubled the number of snapshots, right? So how does that change the overall capacity that's being utilized by my snapshots? Every six hours, I had 20 gigs. Now that I'm doing it every three hours, does it change my 20 gigs? It doesn't, right? Because my change rate is still the same. It's still 10 gigs a day. It's still just two days. So the overall change is exactly the same. Therefore, changing my RPO to three hours, right, from six hours, I, I, I'm not using any more space by doing that. So what about if I, if I get crazy here and I want my RPO to be 15 minutes and I wanna keep 15 minute snapshots for two days, that's a ton of snapshots. How much space are they going to take up? It's still 20 gigs. Lowering your RPO is not going to increase the size of your snapshots. It's only going to increase how often you take the snapshots. And each snapshot is going to be smaller. So in some ways, especially if you're replicating this to another volume on another array, right? So your bandwidth here. By taking snapshots more often, you're doing smaller increments across. So it could theoretically be a good thing. Your RPO drops to 
and that's always better to have a lower RPO. So some people get scared of this idea. I don't want to take snapshots too early because it'll take up too much space. Yes, if you were doing copy on write, you would have write amplification on the back end and it would take up more space. But with, but with redirect on write snapshots, it doesn't take up more space to lower your RPO. You, you determine how much space it takes up by what's your change rate and how many days of retention are you going to keep. So the longer your retention, the more space it takes. The more your change rate, the more space it will take. Does that all make sense, guys? So you don't need to be scared of lowering your RPO, basically is what that comes down to. Let's see here. Coming up on the last half hour of class. Um, so one thing that you do want to look at, right, when you're talking about utilization, it doesn't break up uh, individual snapshots by their utilization. It's all snapshots. Um, and so when you look at a volume, it'll tell you what your snapshot usage is here. And then it'll tell you what the total usage, including snapshots in the data. Um, so it's all averaged out is how that works. But And I used gigs in there, by the way, but generally speaking, change rates are not that high on volumes, usually in megs and kilobytes. Um, let's see, I think we already talked through this concept. We did. So how do you recover from a snapshot? Um, because they're redirect on write, you don't actually have to move any data to do a recovery because the data is already there. It's simply changing the metadata pointers in order to do that. It's also true for zero copy clones. Um, let's do this just for time and simplicity. I'll walk you through what this looks like. So let's say that volume, four snapshots, once an hour. So we got four hours of snapshots for volume one, right? And um, on top of this, inside this volume, we're running a, a SQL database. Um, and in that database, right, we get we get corruption, malware, somebody fat fingers something, it, it dies. And so we need to go back to a point in time. We were doing an upgrade, let's say, and it got corrupted. So we need to go back to an hour before. It would be our preference, right? Because the lower the RPO, the better, the less data that's going to be lost. But mostly we want to pick the snapshot that's before the corruption happened. So you've got a couple different options. One is you can actually take this volume and you can um, you can set the volume offline and then you can actually restore to a point in time. And then you bring it back online and now you're back to a point when your database wasn't corrupted and you just you run from that point. Especially if your snapshot was application consistent, application consistent snapshot, right? So all transactions come back into play. If you only did a crash consistent one, you might have to run your redo logs and get the database normalized and 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 um, up to date again. So that's one way to do it. And it does require though this, you got to take the volume offline to do that. So if SQL is not the only thing running in there, if there's some other servers that are running in there, maybe taking that volume offline might not be a very good idea. But that is, that's one way of restoring from a snapshot. The other way of restoring from a snapshot, is we got our application consistent snapshots here, is you can actually pick your point in time and from that snapshot, you can create a clone. And they call these zero copy clones, meaning there's no data move movement at all. It's really just a metadata tag 
pointing back to this data tree that's now presenting this what looks like a volume. And so when you mount this volume, what's going to be inside there? Your SQL Server with your data database, right? Before that. So there's a couple different things you could do now at this point in time. You could theoretically just start running out of production here, right? And you got a SQL, you got that point in time, you could start running that database, access whatever you need to. But you're tied together here. This volume, even though from a host standpoint, it looks like a standalone volume, it's tied to this data tree. And this data tree includes this point in time where there was some corruption. So, but you can do that. And you, this is full performance. You can, do, you can start doing snapshots on this if you wanted to, all of that kind of stuff. You can basically treat it like its own volume. The other option you have now though, is you could mount this volume or the drive the SQL is in back to this SQL server, right? And now you can do a database restore and bring it back up and running at that point in time. And so now, oops, rather than now you've restored your database back into play. And once that's back up and running the way that you want it, you would simply delete this clone and you're back off and running and running snapshots on your original volume. That tends to be the most common way to restore. And more specifically, what you usually see is what's inside this in a virtual environment. Um, really, you're running VMFS or something like that. That's what's accessing the volume. And what's sitting over the top of that? A bunch of VMs. Right? So something bad happens to your VMs and you want to get back to where you were before. So what do you do? Go to the snapshot, you clone it. You bring it back online and what's inside that? Your VMFS data store with your VMs in here. And maybe it wasn't even all the VMs that got corrupted. It was really just the one. So you don't even have to restore all of them, do you? You mount this back in, you do a storage vMotion back into the original volume. Your VM is now back up and running. And then you can go back and do that. Now you will have to re-index that VM, right? With a different disk signature and all those sort of things. I mean, that's what happens, right? When you bring it back from a backup too. Um, but that's a very easy way to do you know, a VM type of restore and work the same way in a Hyper-V environment. So any questions about restoring from a snapshot? Does that all make sense? So again, I would say if you have any volumes that don't have any snapshots running on them, just do a very small retention and keep a couple snapshots. I mean, it's, it's a great... It's a great way to make sure that you're going to be protected no matter what. And in fact, I had this conversation with a customer last fall. He just hadn't gotten around to setting up snapshots on everything. Um, we did a health check and I said, well, you might as well just turn snapshots on on that stuff. Um, even if it's not something that you, you know, plan to utilize a lot. He turned them on. He was hit by malware the next week. And um, all the stuff that he had snapshots on, because this is air gapped, guys. This, right? all of the, 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 the mean little bugs out here that are going to attack your system, they can't make it past here, right? This, this stuff is not offered up to your application network. And even if they come in here and they destroy all your VMs, they're, all they're doing is changing the live data in here. They're not changing the blocks and the snapshots. So it's completely air-gapped against a malware attack in order to do that. So all the stuff he had snapshotted, he restored out of these snapshots. And he had that stuff up and running in just a couple hours. The other third of his environment that he didn't have snapshots turned on, he, it took him almost four weeks to get all that stuff restored back from backups and up and configured again. So again, if you're gonna manage Nimble in your environment, highly recommend you utilize snapshots, even if that's not your primary way of data protection. All right, any questions on that? 
Make sense? Cool. Um, all right, so here's, if, if you want to know how do I do that, you'll, you, you can do it in the lab as well, but you go to the volume, you select it, um, and you go to data protection, you, you select the, um, the snapshot that you want to clone, and you simply choose the clone option. I mean, that's, it's as easy as that. You can actually automate that process too. Um, one other thing that I'll show you, this is another way people utilize snapshots and clones. Um, in fact, I had a customer that automated this entire process. He's got, he's running SQL, right? This is a SQL database. And um, in this case, it's running on a physical cluster. Um, and so it's running out of a set of volumes, but we're going to simplify this. We'll have one volume and he's got snapshots and he was doing snapshots like every 15 minutes or so and they were application consistent. But what would happen is his, he's actually got multiple SQL environments. And um, so this was SQL prod. Um, and then he had a SQL dev environment too. And uh, they both had their own database. But the, his developers that were running SQL dev, they wanted prod refreshes more often. They were only able to do them like once a quarter using an older you know, process. And so what they, what they did is they automated a process so that they could refresh dev every night. But unfortunately this system had to be up and running all the time. They couldn't take the databases offline. In fact, they were a healthcare provider. And so 24 seven, these systems production needed to be up and running and performant. So they couldn't put this in maintenance mode and do some kind of copy out of it into dev. So what did they do? They utilized these snapshots. So they cloned the snapshot and they, again, they just scripted and automated this in PowerShell. They cloned this, they connected this volume to dev, right? They did a database refresh utilizing the internal SQL tools. And then, then they went back and they just disconnected this drive and this clone. And every night they scripted that. And every day dev, the developers would come in in the morning and they would have refresh data from production in their dev database. So when they did that and they cloned that, did it take up any additional capacity on their Nimble array? No, it didn't take up any additional capacity. Why? Because the clone is pointing back to this data set. Did it utilize any backend I.O.? No, the only I.O. that was associated was the I.O. when they did the refresh and they copied the data into the dev database up here. So there was the right I.O. associated in this particular volume. That was the only I.O. And then there was the read I.O. out of this. But on the back end, there nothing needed to be moved around in order to make that happen. So it was basically instantaneous minus this copy process, which was very fast. All right. Any questions on snapshots, clones used for database ref refreshes?